Today, in audiobooks for me, we are going to listen to The Sign of the Four, the second book from Arthur Conan Doyle about Sherlock Holmes. This book is divided in two videos. Part two, we hope you enjoy it. Chapter eight, The Baker Street Irregulars. What now, I asked. Toby has lost his character for infallibility. He acted according to his lights, said Holmes, lifting him down from the barrel and walking him out of the timber yard. If you consider how much creosote is carted about London in one day, it is no great wonder that our trails should have been crossed. It is much used now, especially for the seasoning of wood. Poor Toby is not to blame. We must get on the main scent again, I suppose. Yes. Unfortunately, we have no distance to go. Evidently what puzzled the dog at the corner of Knight's place was that there were two different trails running in opposite directions. We took the wrong one. It only remains to follow the other. There was no difficulty about this. On leading Toby to the place where he had committed his fault, he cast about in a wide circle and finally dashed off in a fresh direction. We must take care that he does not now bring us to the place where the creosote barrel came from, I observed. I had thought of that, but you notice that he keeps on the pavement, whereas the barrel passed down the roadway. No, we are on the true scent now. It tended down towards the riverside, running through Belmont Place and Prince's Street. At the end of Broad Street, it ran right down to the water's edge, where there was a small wooden wharf. Toby led us to the very edge of this, and there stood whining, looking out on the dark current beyond. We are out of luck, said Holmes. They have taken to a boat here. Several small punts and skiffs were lying about in the water and on the edge of the wharf. We took Toby round to each in turn, but though he sniffed earnestly, he made no sign. Close to the rude landing stage was a small brick house with a wooden placard slung out through the second window. Mordecai Smith was printed across it in large letters and, underneath, boats to hire by the hour or day. A second inscription above the door informed us that a steam launch was kept, a statement which was confirmed by a great pile of coke upon the jetty. Sherlock Holmes looked slowly round, and his face assumed an ominous expression. This looks bad, said he. These fellows are sharper than I expected. They seem to have covered their tracks. There has, I fear, been preconcerted management here. He was approaching the door of the house when it opened, and a little curly-headed lad of six came running out, followed by a stoutish, red-faced woman with a large sponge in her hand. You come back and be washed, Jack, she shouted. Come back, you young imp, for if your father comes home and finds you like that, he'll let us hear of it. Dear little chap, said Holmes strategically, what a rosy-cheeked young rascal. Now, Jack, is there anything you would like? The youth pondered for a moment. I'd like a shillin', said he. Nothing you would like better? I'd like two shillin' better, the prodigy answered after some thought. Here you are, then. Catch! A fine child, Mrs. Smith. Law bless you, sir, he is that, and forward. He gets a most too much for me to manage, especially when my man is away days at a time. Away, is he? said Holmes, in a disappointed voice. I am sorry for that, for I wanted to speak to Mr. Smith. He's been away since yesterday morning, sir, and truth to tell, I am beginning to feel frightened about him, but if it was about a boat, sir, maybe I could serve as well. I wanted to hire his steam launch. Why, bless you, sir, it is in the steam launch that he has gone. That's what puzzles me, for I know there ain't more coals in her than would take her to about Woolwich and back. If he'd been away in the barge, I'd have thought nothing, for many a time a job has taken him as far as Gravesend, and then if there was much doing there, he might have stayed over. But what good is a steam launch without coals? And then he might have bought some at a wharf down the river. He might, sir, but it weren't his way. Many a time I've heard him call out at the prices they charge for a few odd bags. Besides, 
I don't like that wooden-legged man, with his ugly face and outlandish talk. What did he want always knocking about here for? A wooden-legged man, said Holmes with bland surprise. Yes, sir, a brown monkey-faced chap that's called more than once for my old man. It was him that roused him up yesternight, and, what's more, my man knew he was coming, for he had steam up in the launch. I tell you straight, sir, I don't feel easy in my mind about it. But, my dear Mrs. Smith, said Holmes, shrugging his shoulders, you are frightening yourself about nothing. How could you possibly tell that it was the wooden-legged man who came in the night? I don't quite understand how you can be so sure. His voice, sir? I knew his voice, which is kind of thick and foggy. He tapped at the window. About three it would be. Show a leg, matey, says he. Time to turn out guard. My old man woke up Jim. That's my eldest, and, he'll... and away they went, without so much as a word to me. I could hear the wooden leg clacking on the stones. And was this wooden-legged man alone? Couldn't say, I am sure, sir. I didn't hear no one else. I am sorry, Mrs. Smith, for I wanted a steam launch, and I've heard good reports of the— let me see, what is her name? The Aurora, sir. Ah, she's not that old green launch with a yellow line, very broad in the beam? No, indeed. She's as trim a little thing as any on the river. She's been fresh painted, black with two red streaks. Thanks. I hope that you will hear soon from Mr. Smith. I am going down the river, and if I should see anything of the Aurora, I shall let him know that you are uneasy. A black funnel, you say? No, sir. Black with a white band. Ah, of course. It was the sides which were black. Good morning, Mrs. Smith. There is a boatman here with a wherry, Watson. We shall take it and cross the river. The main thing with people of that sort, said Holmes, as we sat in the sheets of the wherry, is never to let them think that their information can be of the slightest importance to you. If you do, they will instantly shut up like an oyster. If you listen to them under protest, as it were, you are very likely to get what you want. Our course now seems pretty clear, said I. What would you do, then? I would engage a launch and go down the river on the track of the Aurora. My dear fellow, it would be a colossal task. She may have touched at any wharf on either side of the stream between here and Greenwich. Below the bridge, there is a perfect labyrinth of landing places for miles. It would take you days and days to exhaust them if you set about it alone. Employ the police, then. No, I shall probably call Athelney Jones in at the last moment. He is not a bad fellow, and I should not like to do anything which would injure him professionally, but I have a fancy for working it out myself now that we have gone so far. Could we advertise, then, asking for information from Warfingers? Worse and worse. Our men would know that the chase was hot at their heels, and they would be off, out of the country. As it is, they are likely enough to leave, but as long as they think they are perfectly safe, they will be in no hurry. Jones's energy will be of use to us there, for his view of the case is sure to push itself into the daily press, and the runaways will think that everyone is off on the wrong scent. What are we to do then? I asked, as we landed near Millbank Penitentiary. Take this hansom, drive home, have some breakfast, and get an hour's sleep. It is quite on the cards that we may be afoot tonight again. Stop at a telegraph office, cabby. We will keep Toby, for he may be of use to us yet. We pulled up at the Great Peter Street Post Office, and Holmes dispatched his wire. Whom do you think that is to, he asked, as we resumed our journey. I am sure I don't know. You remember the Baker Street Division of the Detective Police Force whom I employed in the Jefferson Hope case? Well said I, laughing. This is just the case where they might be invaluable. If they fail, I have other resources, but I shall try them first. That wire was to my dirty little Lieutenant Wiggins, and I expect that he and his gang will be with us before we have finished our breakfast. It was between eight and nine o'clock now, and I was conscious of a strong reaction after the successive excitements of the night. I was limp and weary, befogged in mind and fatigued in body. 
I had not the professional enthusiasm which carried my companion on, nor could I look at the matter as a mere abstract intellectual problem. As far as the death of Bartholomew Sholto went, I had heard little good of him, and could feel no intense antipathy to his murderers. The treasure, however, was a different matter. That, or part of it, belonged rightfully to Miss Morstan. While there was a chance of recovering it, I was ready to devote my life to the one object. True, if I found it, it would probably put her forever beyond my reach, yet it would be a petty and selfish love which would be influenced by such a thought as that. If Holmes could work to find the criminals, I had a tenfold stronger reason to urge me on to find the treasure. A bath at Baker Street and a complete change freshened me up wonderfully. When I came down to our room, I found the breakfast laid and Holmes pouring out the coffee. Here it is said he, laughing and pointing to an open newspaper. The energetic Jones and the ubiquitous reporter have fixed it up between them, but you have had enough of the case. Better have your ham and eggs first. I took the paper from him and read the short notice which was headed Mysterious Business at Upper Norwood. About twelve o'clock last night, said the Standard, Mr. Bartholomew Sholto of Pondicherry Lodge, Upper Norwood, was found dead in his room under circumstances which point to foul play. As far as we can learn, no actual traces of violence were found upon Mr. Sholto's person, but a valuable collection of Indian gems which the deceased gentleman had inherited from his father has been carried off. The discovery was first made by Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, who had called at the house with Mr. Thaddeus Sholto, brother of the deceased. By a singular piece of good fortune, Mr. Athelney Jones, the well-known member of the detective police force, happened to be at the Norwood police station, and was on the ground within half an hour of the first alarm. His trained and experienced faculties were at once directed towards the detection of the criminals with the gratifying result that the brother, Thaddeus Sholto, has already been arrested, together with the housekeeper, Mrs. Burnstone, an Indian butler named Lal Rao, and a porter or gatekeeper named McMurdo. It is quite certain that the thief or thieves were well acquainted with the house, for Mr. Jones's well-known technical knowledge and his powers of minute observation have enabled him to prove conclusively that the miscreants could not have entered by the door or by the window, but must have made their way across the roof of the building, and so, through a trapdoor, into a room which communicated with that in which the body was found. This fact, which has been very clearly made out, proves conclusively that it was no mere haphazard burglary. The prompt and energetic action of the officers of the law shows the great advantage of the presence on such occasions of a single, vigorous and masterful mind. We cannot but think that it supplies an argument to those who would wish to see our detectives more decentralized, and so brought into closer and more effective touch with the cases which it is their duty to investigate. "'Isn't it gorgeous?' said Holmes, grinning over his coffee cup. "'What do you think of it?' I think that we have had a close shave ourselves of being arrested for the crime. So do I. I wouldn't answer for our safety now if he should happen to have another of his attacks of energy. At this moment there was a loud ring at the bell, and I could hear Mrs. Hudson, our landlady, raising her voice in a wail of expostulation and dismay. By heaven, Holmes, I said, half rising, I believe that they are really after us. No, it's not quite so bad as that. It is the unofficial force, the Baker Street Irregulars. As he spoke, there came a swift pattering of naked feet upon the stairs, a clatter of high voices, and in rushed a dozen dirty and ragged little street Arabs. There was some show of discipline among them, despite their tumultuous entry, for they instantly drew up in line and stood facing us with expectant faces. One of their number, taller and older than the others, stood forward with an air of lounging superiority which was very funny in such a disreputable little scarecrow. 
Got your message, sir, said he, and brought him on sharp, three bob and a tanner for tickets. Here you are, said Holmes, producing some silver. In future they can report to you, Wiggins, and you to me. I cannot have the house invaded in this way. However, it is just as well that you should all hear the instructions. I want to find the whereabouts of a steam launch called the Aurora, owner Mordecai Smith, black with two red streaks, funnel black with a white band. She is down the river somewhere. I want one boy to be at Mordecai Smith's landing stage opposite Millbank to say if the boat comes back. You must divide it out among yourselves and do both banks thoroughly. Let me know the moment you have news. Is that all clear? Yes, Governor, said Wiggins. The old scale of pay and a guinea to the boy who finds the boat. Here's a day in advance. Now off you go. He handed them a shilling each, and away they buzzed down the stairs, and I saw them a moment later streaming down the street. If the launch is above water, they will find her, said Holmes as he rose from the table and lit his pipe. They can go everywhere, see everything, overhear everyone. I expect to hear before evening that they have spotted her. In the meanwhile, we can do nothing but await results. We cannot pick up the broken trail until we find either the Aurora or Mr. Mordecai Smith. Toby could eat these scraps, I dare say. Are you going to bed, Holmes? No, I am not tired. I have a curious constitution. I never remember feeling tired by work, though idleness exhausts me completely. I am going to smoke and to think over this queer business to which my fair client has introduced us. If ever man had an easy task, this of ours ought to be. Wooden-legged men are not so common, but the other man must, I should think, be absolutely unique. That other man again. I have no wish to make a mystery of him, to you anyway. But you must have formed your own opinion. Now do consider the data. Diminutive footmarks, toes never fettered by boots, naked feet, stone-headed wooden mace, great agility, small poisoned darts. What do you make of all this? A savage, I exclaimed. Perhaps one of those Indians who were the associates of Jonathan Small. Hardly that, said he. When first I saw signs of strange weapons, I was inclined to think so. But the remarkable character of the footmarks caused me to reconsider my views. Some of the inhabitants of the Indian peninsula are small men, but none could have left such marks as that. The Hindu proper has long and thin feet. The sandal-wearing Mohammedan has the great toe well separated from the others, because the thong is commonly passed between. These little darts, too, could only be shot in one way. They are from a blowpipe. Now then, where are we to find our savage? South American, I hazarded. He stretched his hand up and took down a bulky volume from the shelf. This is the first volume of a gazetteer which is now being published. It may be looked upon as the very latest authority. What have we here? Andaman Islands, situated 340 miles to the north of Sumatra, in the Bay of Bengal. Hmm, hmm. What's all this? Moist climate, coral reefs, sharks, Port Blair, convict barracks, Rutland Island, cottonwoods. Ah, here we are. The Aborigines of the Andaman Islands may perhaps claim the distinction of being the smallest race upon this earth though some anthropologists prefer the Bushmen of Africa, the Digger Indians of America, and the Terra del Fuegians. The average height is rather below four feet, although many full-grown adults may be found who are very much smaller than this. They are a fierce, morose, and intractable people, though capable of forming most devoted friendships when their confidence has once been gained. Mark that, Watson. Now then, listen to this. They are naturally hideous, having large, misshapen heads, small, fierce eyes, and distorted features. Their feet and hands, however, are remarkably small. So intractable and fierce are they that all the efforts of the British official have failed to win them over in any degree. They have always been a terror to shipwrecked crews, braining the survivors with their stone-headed clubs, or shooting them with their poisoned arrows, these massacres are invariably concluded by a cannibal feast. 
Nice, amiable people, Watson. If this fellow had been left to his own unaided devices, this affair might have taken an even more ghastly turn. I fancy that, even as it is, Jonathan Small would give a good deal not to have employed him. But how came he to have so singular a companion? Ah, that is more than I can tell, since, however, we had already determined that Small had come from the Andamans, it is not so very wonderful that this islander should be with him. No doubt we shall know all about it in time. Look here, Watson, you look regularly done. Lie down there on the sofa and see if I can put you to sleep. He took up his violin from the corner, and as I stretched myself out, he began to play some low, dreamy, melodious air, his own, no doubt, for he had a remarkable gift for improvisation. I have a vague remembrance of his gaunt limbs, his earnest face, and the rise and fall of his bow. Then I seemed to be floated peacefully away upon a soft sea of sound, until I found myself in dreamland, with the sweet face of Mary Morstan looking down upon me. Chapter 9 A Break in the Chain It was late in the afternoon before I woke, strengthened and refreshed. Sherlock Holmes still sat exactly as I had left him, save that he had laid aside his violin and was deep in a book. He looked across at me as I stirred, and I noticed that his face was dark and troubled. You have slept soundly, he said. I feared that our talk would wake you. I heard nothing, I answered. Have you had fresh news, then? Unfortunately, no. I confess that I am surprised and disappointed. I expected something definite by this time. Wiggins has just been up to report. He says that no trace can be found of the launch. It is a provoking check, for every hour is of importance. Can I do anything? I am perfectly fresh now and quite ready for another night's outing. No, we can do nothing. We can only wait. If we go ourselves, the message might come in our absence and delay be caused. You can do what you will, but I must remain on guard. Then I shall run over to Camberwell and call upon Mrs. Cecil Forrester. She asked me to yesterday. On Mrs. Cecil Forrester? asked Holmes, with the twinkle of a smile in his eyes. Well, of course, Miss Morstan too. They were anxious to hear what happened. I would not tell them too much, said Holmes. Women are never to be entirely trusted, not the best of them. I did not pause to argue over this atrocious sentiment. I shall be back in an hour or two, I remarked. All right, good luck. But I say, if you are crossing the river, you may as well return Toby, for I don't think it is at all likely that we shall have any use for him now. I took our mongrel accordingly and left him, together with a half-sovereign, at the old naturalist's in Pynchon Lane. At Camberwell, I found Miss Morstan a little weary after her night's adventures, but very eager to hear the news. Mrs. Forrester, too, was full of curiosity. I told them all that we had done, suppressing, however, the more dreadful parts of the tragedy. Thus, although I spoke of Mr. Sholto's death, I said nothing of the exact manner and method of it. With all my omissions, however, there was enough to startle and amaze them, it is a romance, cried Mrs. Forrester, an injured lady, half a million in treasure, a black cannibal, and a wooden-legged ruffian. They take the place of the conventional dragon or wicked earl. And two knight-errants to the rescue, added Miss Morstan, with a bright glance at me. Why, Mary, your fortune depends upon the issue of this search. I don't think that you are nearly excited enough. Just imagine what it must be to be so rich and to have the world at your feet. It sent a little thrill of joy to my heart to notice that she showed no sign of elation at the prospect. On the contrary, she gave a toss of her proud head, as though the matter were one in which she took small interest. It is for Mr. Thaddeus Sholto that I am anxious, she said. Nothing else is of any consequence, but I think that he has behaved most kindly and honourably throughout. It is our duty to clear him of this dreadful and unfounded charge.
It was evening before I left Camberwell, and quite dark by the time I reached home. My companion's book and pipe lay by his chair, but he had disappeared. I looked about in the hope of seeing a note, but there was none. I suppose that Mr. Sherlock Holmes has gone out, I said to Mrs. Hudson, as she came up to lower the blinds. No, sir, he has gone to his room, sir. Do you know, sir? Sinking her voice into an impressive whisper. I'm afraid for his health? Why so, Mrs. Hudson? Well, he's that strange, sir. After you was gone, he walked and he walked up and down and up and down, until I was weary of the sound of his footstep. Then I heard him talking to himself and muttering, and every time the bell rang out he came on the stairhead with, What is that, Mrs. Hudson? And now he has slammed off to his room, but I can hear him walking away the same as ever. I hope he's not going to be ill, sir. I ventured to say something to him about cooling medicine, but he turned on me, sir, with such a look that I don't know how ever I got out of the room. I don't think that you have any cause to be uneasy, Mrs. Hudson, I answered. I have seen him like this before. He has some small matter upon his mind which makes him restless. I tried to speak lightly to our worthy landlady, but I was myself somewhat uneasy when through the long night I still from time to time heard the dull sound of his tread, and knew how his keen spirit was chafing against this involuntary inaction. At breakfast time he looked worn and haggard, with a little fleck of feverish colour upon either cheek. "'You are knocking yourself up, old man,' I remarked. "'I heard you marching about in the night.' "'No, I could not sleep,' he answered. "'This infernal problem is consuming me. It is too much to be balked by so petty an obstacle when all else had been overcome. I know the men, the launch, everything, and yet I can get no news. I have set other agencies at work and used every means at my disposal. The whole river has been searched on either side, but there is no news, nor has Mrs. Smith heard of her husband. I shall come to the conclusion soon that they have scuttled the craft, but there are objections to that or that Mrs. Smith has put us on a wrong scent. No, I think that may be dismissed. I had inquiries made, and there is a launch of that description. Could it have gone up the river? I have considered that possibility too, and there is a search party who will work up as far as Richmond. If no news comes today, I shall start off myself tomorrow and go for the men rather than the boat. But surely, surely we shall hear something. We did not, however. Not a word came to us either from Wiggins or from the other agencies. There were articles in most of the papers upon the Norwood tragedy. They all appeared to be rather hostile to the unfortunate Thaddeus Sholto. No fresh details were to be found, however, in any of them, save that an inquest was to be held upon the following day. I walked over to Camberwell in the evening to report our ill success to the ladies, and on my return I found Holmes dejected and somewhat morose. He would hardly reply to my questions and busied himself all evening in an abstruse chemical analysis which involved much heating of retorts and distilling of vapours, ending at last in a smell which fairly drove me out of the apartment. Up to the small hours of the morning I could hear the clinking of his test-tubes, which told me that he was still engaged in his malodorous experiment. In the early dawn I woke with a start, and was surprised to find him standing by my bedside, clad in a rude sailor dress with a pea-jacket and a coarse red scarf round his neck. "'I am off down the river, Watson,' said he. "'I have been turning it over in my mind, and I can see only one way out of it. It is worth trying, at all events.' "'Surely I can come with you, then,' said I. "'No, you can be much more useful if you will remain here as my representative. "'I am loath to go, for it is quite on the cards that some message may come during the day, "'though Wiggins was despondent about it last night. "'I want you to open all notes and telegrams, and to act on your own judgment if any news should come. "'Can I rely upon you?' "'Most certainly.' I am afraid that you will not be able to wire to me, for I can hardly tell yet where I may find myself. If I am in luck, however, I may not be gone so very long. I shall have news of some sort or other, 
before I get back. I had heard nothing of him by breakfast time. On opening the standard, however, I found that there was a fresh allusion to the business. With reference to the Upper Norwood tragedy, it remarked, we have reason to believe that the matter promises to be even more complex and mysterious than was originally supposed. Fresh evidence has shown that it is quite impossible that Mr. Thaddeus Sholto could have been in any way concerned in the matter. He and the housekeeper, Mrs. Burnstone, were both released yesterday evening. It is believed, however, that the police have a clue as to the real culprits, and that it is being prosecuted by Mr. Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard with all his well-known energy and sagacity. Further arrests may be expected at any moment. That is satisfactory so far as it goes, thought I. Friend Sholto is safe at any rate. I wonder what the fresh clue may be, though it seems to be a stereotyped form whenever the police have made a blunder. I tossed the paper down upon the table, but at that moment my eye caught an advertisement in the agony column. It ran in this way. Lost. Whereas Mordecai Smith, boatman and his son Jim, left Smith's Wharf at or about three o'clock last Tuesday morning in the steam launch Aurora, black with two red stripes, funnel black with a white band. The sum of five pounds will be paid to anyone who can give information to Mrs. Smith at Smith's Wharf or at 221 B. Baker Street as to the whereabouts of the said Mordecai Smith and the Launch Aurora. This was clearly Holmes's doing. The Baker Street address was enough to prove that. It struck me as rather ingenious, because it might be read by the fugitives without their seeing in it more than the natural anxiety of a wife for her missing husband. It was a long day. Every time that a knock came to the door or a sharp step passed in the street, I imagined that it was either Holmes returning or an answer to his advertisement. I tried to read, but my thoughts would wander off to our strange quest and to the ill-assorted and villainous pair whom we were pursuing. Could there be, I wondered, some radical flaw in my companion's reasoning? Might he be suffering from some huge self-deception? Was it not possible that his nimble and speculative mind had built up this wild theory upon faulty premises? I had never known him to be wrong, and yet the keenest reasoner may occasionally be deceived. He was likely, I thought, to fall into error through the over-refinement of his logic. His preference for a subtle and bizarre explanation, when a plainer and more commonplace one, lay ready to his hand. Yet on the other hand, I had myself seen the evidence, and I had heard the reasons for his deductions. When I looked back on the long chain of curious circumstances, many of them trivial in themselves, but all tending in the same direction, I could not disguise from myself that even if Holmes's explanation were incorrect, the true theory must be equally outré and startling. At three o'clock in the afternoon there was a loud peal at the bell, an authoritative voice in the hall, and, to my surprise, no less a person than Mr. Athelney Jones was shown up to me. Very different was he, however, from the brusque and masterful professor of common sense who had taken over the case so confidently at Upper Norwood. His expression was downcast, and his bearing meek and even apologetic. "'Good day, sir.' "'Good day,' said he. "'Mr. Sherlock Holmes is out, I understand.' "'Yes, and I cannot be sure when he will be back, but perhaps you would care to wait.' Take that chair and try one of these cigars. Thank you. I don't mind if I do, said he, mopping his face with a red bandana handkerchief. And a whiskey and soda? Well, half a glass. It is very hot for the time of year, and I have had a good deal to worry and try me. You know my theory about this Norwood case? I remember that you expressed one. Well, I have been obliged to reconsider it. I had my net drawn tightly round Mr. Sholto, sir, when pop, he went through a hole in the middle of it. He was able to prove an alibi which could not be shaken. 
From the time that he left his brother's room, he was never out of sight of someone or other. So it could not be he who climbed over roofs and through trap doors. It's a very dark case, and my professional credit is at stake. I should be very glad of a little assistance. We all need help sometimes, said I. Your friend Mr. Sherlock Holmes is a wonderful man, sir, said he, in a husky and confidential voice. He's a man who is not to be beat. I have known that young man go into a good many cases, but I never saw the case yet that he could not throw a light upon. He is irregular in his methods, and a little quick, perhaps in jumping at theories. But on the whole, I think he would have made a most promising officer, and I don't care who knows it. I have had a wire from him this morning, by which I understand that he has got some clue to this Sholto business. Here is the message. He took the telegram out of his pocket and handed it to me. It was dated from Poplar at twelve o'clock. Go to Baker Street at once, it said. If I have not returned, wait for me. I am close on the track of the Sholto gang. You can come with us tonight if you want to be in at the finish. This sounds well. He has evidently picked up the scent again, said I. Ah, then he has been at fault too, exclaimed Jones with evident satisfaction. Even the best of us are thrown off sometimes. Of course this may prove to be a false alarm, but it is my duty as an officer of the law to allow no chance to slip. But there is someone at the door. Perhaps this is he. A heavy step was heard ascending the stair, with a great wheezing and rattling, as from a man who was sorely put to it for breath. Once or twice he stopped, as though the climb were too much for him, but at last he made his way to our door and entered. His appearance corresponded to the sounds which we had heard. He was an aged man, clad in seafaring garb, with an old pea-jacket buttoned up to his throat. His back was bowed, his knees were shaky, and his breathing was painfully asthmatic. As he leaned upon a thick oaken cudgel, his shoulders heaved in the effort to draw the air into his lungs. He had a coloured scarf round his chin, and I could see little of his face save a pair of keen dark eyes, overhung by bushy white brows and long grey side whiskers. Altogether he gave me the impression of a respectable master mariner who had fallen into years and poverty. "'What is it, my man?' I asked. He looked about him in the slow, methodical fashion of old age. "'Is Mr. Sherlock Holmes here?' said he. "'No, but I am acting for him. You can tell me any message you have for him.' "'It was to him himself I was to tell it,' said he. "'But I tell you that I am acting for him.' Was it about Mordecai Smith's boat? Yes. I knows well where it is. And I knows where the men he is after are. And I knows where the treasure is. I knows all about it. Then tell me, and I shall let him know. It was to him I was to tell it, he repeated, with the petulant obstinacy of a very old man. Well, you must wait for him. No, no. I ain't going to lose a whole day to please no one. If Mr. Holmes ain't here, then Mr. Holmes must find it all out for himself. I don't care about the look of either of you, and I won't tell a word. He shuffled towards the door, but Athelney Jones got in front of him. Wait a bit, my friend, said he. You have important information, and you must not walk off. We shall keep you, whether you like or not, until our friend returns. The old man made a little run towards the door, but as Athony Jones put his broad back up against it, he recognized the uselessness of resistance. "'Pretty sort of treatment, this,' he cried, stamping his stick. "'I come here to see a gentleman, and you two, who I never saw in my life, seize me and treat me in this fashion.' "'You will be none the worse,' I said. "'We shall recompense you for the loss of your time.' Sit over here on the sofa, and you will not have long to wait. He came across sullenly enough, and seated himself with his face resting on his hands. Jones and I resumed our cigars and our talk. Suddenly, however, Holmes's voice broke in upon us. I think that you might offer me a cigar, too, he said. We both started in our chairs. 
there was Holmes sitting close to us with an air of quiet amusement. Holmes! I exclaimed. You here, but where is the old man? Here is the old man, said he, holding out a heap of white hair. Here he is, wig, whiskers, eyebrows and all. I thought my disguise was pretty good, but I hardly expected that it would stand that test. Ah, you rogue! cried Jones, highly delighted. You would have made an actor, and a rare one. You had the proper workhouse cough, and those weak legs of yours are worth ten pounds a week. I thought I knew the glint of your eye, though. You didn't get away from us so easily, you see. I have been working in that get-up all day, said he, lighting his cigar. You see, a good many of the criminal classes begin to know me, especially since our friend here took to publishing some of my cases, so I can only go on the warpath under some simple disguise like this. You got my wire? Yes, that was what brought me here. How has your case prospered? It has all come to nothing. I have had to release two of my prisoners, and there is no evidence against the other two. Never mind. We shall give you two others in the place of them. But you must put yourself under my orders. You are welcome to all the official credit, but you must act on the line that I point out. Is that agreed? Entirely, if you will help me to the men. Well, then, in the first place, I shall want a fast police boat, a steam launch, to be at the Westminster Stairs at seven o'clock. That is easily managed. There is always one about there but I can step across the road and telephone to make sure. Then I shall want two stanch men, in case of resistance. There will be two or three in the boat. What else? When we secure the men, we shall get the treasure. I think that it would be a pleasure to my friend here to take the box round to the young lady to whom half of it rightfully belongs. Let her be the first to open it. Eh, Watson? It would be a great pleasure to me. Rather. An irregular proceeding, said Jones, shaking his head. However, the whole thing is irregular, and I suppose we must wink at it. The treasure must afterwards be handed over to the authorities until after the official investigation. Certainly, that is easily managed. One other point. I should much like to have a few details about this matter from the lips of Jonathan Small himself. You know I like to work the detail of my cases out. There is no objection to my having an unofficial interview with him, either here in my rooms or elsewhere, as long as he is efficiently guarded. Well, you are master of the situation. I have had no proof yet of the existence of this Jonathan Small. However, if you can catch him, I don't see how I can refuse you an interview with him. That is understood, then? Perfectly. Is there anything else? Only that I insist upon your dining with us. It will be ready in half an hour. I have oysters and a brace of grouse, with something a little choice in white wines. Watson, you have never yet recognized my merits as a housekeeper. Chapter 10. The End of the Islander Our meal was a merry one. Holmes could talk exceedingly well when he chose, and that night he did choose. He appeared to be in a state of nervous exultation. I have never known him so brilliant. He spoke on a quick succession of subjects, on miracle plays, on medieval pottery, on Stradivarius violins, on the Buddhism of Ceylon, and on the warships of the future, handling each as though he had made a special study of it. His bright humour marked the reaction from his black depression of the preceding days. Athony Jones proved to be a sociable soul in his hours of relaxation and faced his dinner with the air of a bon vivant. For myself, I felt elated at the thought that we were nearing the end of our task, and I caught something of Holmes's gaiety. None of us alluded during dinner to the cause which had brought us together. When the cloth was cleared, Holmes glanced at his watch and filled up three glasses with port. One bumper, said he, to the success of our little expedition, and now it is high time we were off. Have you a pistol, Watson? I have my old service revolver in my desk. You had best take it, then. It is well to be prepared. I see that the cab is at the door. I ordered it for half-past six. It was a little past seven before we reached the Westminster Wharf and found our launch awaiting us. Holmes eyed it critically. 
Is there anything to mark it as a police boat? Yes, that green lamp at the side. Then take it off. The small change was made, we stepped on board, and the ropes were cast off. Jones, Holmes, and I sat in the stern. There was one man at the rudder, one to tend the engines, and two burly police inspectors forward. Where to? asked Jones. To the tower. Tell them to stop opposite Jacobson's yard. Our craft was evidently a very fast one. We shot past the long lines of loaded barges as though they were stationary. Holmes smiled with satisfaction as we overhauled a river steamer and left her behind us. We ought to be able to catch anything on the river, he said. Well, hardly that. But there are not many launches to beat us. We shall have to catch the Aurora, and she has a name for being a clipper. I will tell you how the land lies, Watson. You recollect how annoyed I was at being balked by so small a thing? Yes. Well, I gave my mind a thorough rest by plunging into a chemical analysis. One of our greatest statesmen has said that a change of work is the best rest. So it is. When I had succeeded in dissolving the hydrocarbon which I was at work at, I came back to our problem of the Sholtos, and thought the whole matter out again. My boys had been up the river and down the river without result. The launch was not at any landing stage or wharf, nor had it returned. Yet it could hardly have been scuttled to hide their traces, though that always remained as a possible hypothesis if all else failed. I knew this man Small had a certain degree of low cunning, but I did not think him capable of anything in the nature of delicate finesse. That is usually a product of higher education. I then reflected that since he had certainly been in London some time, as we had evidence that he maintained a continual watch over Pondicherry Lodge, he could hardly leave at a moment's notice, but would need some little time, if it were only a day, to arrange his affairs. That was the balance of probability, at any rate. It seems to me to be a little weak, said I. It is more probable that he had arranged his affairs before ever he set out upon his expedition. No, I hardly think so. This lair of his would be too valuable a retreat in case of need for him to give it up until he was sure that he could do without it. But a second consideration struck me. Jonathan Small must have felt that the peculiar appearance of his companion, however much he may have top-coated him, would give rise to gossip and possibly be associated with this Norwood tragedy. He was quite sharp enough to see that. They had started from their headquarters under cover of darkness, and he would wish to get back before it was broad light. Now it was past three o'clock, according to Mrs. Smith, when they got the boat. It would be quite bright and people would be about in an hour or so. Therefore, I argued, they did not go very far. They paid Smith well to hold his tongue, reserved his launch for the final escape, and hurried to their lodgings with the treasure box. In a couple of nights, when they had time to see what view the papers took, and whether there was any suspicion, they would make their way under cover of darkness to some ship at Gravesend, or in the Downs, where no doubt they had already arranged for passages to America or the colonies. But the launch? They could not have taken that to their lodgings. Quite so. I argued that the launch must be no great way off in spite of its invisibility. I then put myself in the place of Small and looked at it as a man of his capacity would. He would probably consider that to send back the launch or to keep it at a wharf would make pursuit easy if the police did happen to get on his track. How, then, could he conceal the launch and yet have her at hand when wanted? I wondered what I should do myself if I were in his shoes. I could only think of one way of doing it. I might hand the launch over to some boat builder or repairer with directions to make a trifling change in her. She would then be removed to his shed or yard, and so be effectually concealed, while at the same time I could have her at a few hours' notice. That seems simple enough. It is just these very simple things which are extremely liable to be overlooked. However, I determined to act on the idea. I started at once in this harmless seaman's rig, 
and inquired at all the yards down the river. I drew blank at fifteen, but at the sixteenth Jacobson's I learned that the Aurora had been handed over to them two days ago by a wooden-legged man, with some trivial directions as to her rudder. There ain't naught amiss with her rudder, said the foreman. There she lies, with the red streaks. At that moment who should come down but Mordecai Smith, the missing owner? He was rather the worse for liquor. I should not, of course, have known him, but he bellowed out his name and the name of his launch. I want her tonight at eight o'clock, said he, eight o'clock sharp, mind, for I have two gentlemen who won't be kept waiting. They had evidently paid him well, for he was very flush of money, chucking shillings about to the men. I followed him some distance, but he subsided into an alehouse. So I went back to the yard, and happening to pick up one of my boys on the way, I stationed him as a sentry over the launch. He is to stand at water's edge and wave his handkerchief to us when they start. We shall be lying off in the stream, and it will be a strange thing if we do not take men, treasure, and all. You have planned it all very neatly, whether they are the right men or not, said Jones, but if the affair were in my hands, I should have had a body of police in Jacobson's yard and arrested them when they came down. Which would have been never. This man Small is a pretty shrewd fellow. He would send a scout on ahead, and if anything made him suspicious, lie snug for another week. But you might have stuck to Mordecai Smith and so been led to their hiding place, said I. In that case, I should have wasted my day. I think that it is a hundred to one against Smith knowing where they live. As long as he has liquor and good pay, why should he ask questions? They send him messages what to do. No, I thought over every possible course, and this is the best. While this conversation had been proceeding, we had been shooting the long series of bridges which span the Thames. As we passed the city, the last rays of the sun were gilding the cross upon the summit of St. Paul's S. It was twilight before we reached the tower. That is Jacobson's yard, said Holmes, pointing to a bristle of masts and rigging on the Surrey side. Cruise gently up and down here under cover of this string of lighters. He took a pair of night glasses from his pocket and gazed some time at the shore. I see my sentry at his post, he remarked but no sign of a handkerchief. Suppose we go downstream a short way and lie in wait for them, said Jones, eagerly. We were all eager by this time, even the policemen and stokers, who had a very vague idea of what was going forward. We have no right to take anything for granted, Holmes answered. It is certainly ten to one that they go downstream, but we cannot be certain. From this point we can see the entrance of the yard and they can hardly see us. It will be a clear night and plenty of light. We must stay where we are. See how the folks swarm over yonder in the gaslight. They are coming from work in the yard. Dirty-looking rascals, but I suppose everyone has some little immortal spark concealed about him. You would not think it to look at them. There is no a priori probability about it. A strange enigma is man. Someone calls him a soul concealed in an animal, I suggested. Winwood Reed is good upon the subject, said Holmes. He remarks that, while the individual man is an insoluble puzzle in the aggregate, he becomes a mathematical certainty. You can, for example, never foretell what any one man will do, but you can say with precision what an average number will be up to. Individuals vary, but percentages remain constant. So says the statistician. But do I see a handkerchief? Surely there is a white flutter over yonder. Yes, it is your boy, I cried. I can see him plainly. And there is the aurora, exclaimed Holmes, and going like the devil. Full speed ahead, engineer. Make after that launch with the yellow light. By heaven, I shall never forgive myself if she proves to have the heels of us. She had slipped unseen through the yard entrance and passed behind two or three small craft, so that she had fairly got her speed up before we saw her. Now she was flying down the stream, near into the shore, going at a tremendous rate. Jones looked gravely at her and shook his head. She is very fast, he said. I doubt if we shall catch her. 
We must catch her, cried Holmes between his teeth. Keep it on, Stokers. Make her do all she can. If we burn the boat, we must have them. We were fairly after her now. The furnaces roared, and the powerful engines whizzed and clanked like a great metallic heart. Her sharp, steep prow cut through the river water and sent two rolling waves to right and to left of us. With every throb of the engines we sprang and quivered like a living thing. One great yellow lantern in our bows threw a long, flickering funnel of light in front of us. Right ahead, a dark blur upon the water showed where the aurora lay, and the swirl of white foam behind her spoke of the pace at which she was going. We flashed past barges, steamers, merchant vessels, in and out, behind this one and round the other. Voices hailed us out of the darkness, but still the aurora thundered on, and still we followed close upon her track. Pile it on, men! Pile it on! cried Holmes, looking down into the engine room, while the fierce glow from below beat upon his eager, aquiline face. Get every pound of steam you can. I think we gain a little, said Jones, with his eyes on the aurora. I am sure of it, said I. We shall be up with her in a very few minutes. At that moment, however, as our evil fate would have it, a tug with three barges in tow blundered in between us. It was only by putting our helm hard down that we avoided a collision, and before we could round them and recover our way, the aurora had gained a good two hundred yards. She was still, however, well in view, and the murky, uncertain twilight was setting into a clear, starlit night. Our boilers were strained to their utmost, and the frail shell vibrated and creaked with the fierce energy which was driving us along. We had shot through the pool, past the West India docks, down the long Deptford Reach, and up again after rounding the Isle of Dogs. The dull blur in front of us resolved itself now clearly enough into the dainty aurora. Jones turned our searchlight upon her, so that we could plainly see the figures upon her deck. One man sat by the stern, with something black between his knees over which he stooped. Beside him lay a dark mass, which looked like a Newfoundland dog. The boy held the tiller, while against the red glare of the furnace I could see old Smith, stripped to the waist and shoveling coals for dear life. They may have had some doubt at first as to whether we were really pursuing them, but now, as we followed every winding and turning which they took, there could no longer be any question about it. At Greenwich we were about three hundred paces behind them. At Blackwall we could not have been more than two hundred and fifty. I have coursed many creatures in many countries during my chequered career, but never did sport give me such a wild thrill as this mad flying manhunt down the Thames. Steadily we drew in upon them, yard by yard. In the silence of the night we could hear the panting and clanking of their machinery. The man in the stern still crouched upon the deck, and his arms were moving as though he were busy, while every now and then he would look up and measure with a glance the distance which still separated us. Nearer we came and nearer. Jones yelled to them to stop. We were not more than four boats' lengths behind them, both boats flying at a tremendous pace. It was a clear reach of the river, with barking level upon one side and the melancholy Plumstead marshes upon the other. At our hail, the man in the stern sprang up from the deck and shook his two clinched fists at us, cursing the while in a high, cracked voice. He was a good-sized, powerful man, and as he stood poising himself with legs astride, I could see that from the thigh downwards there was but a wooden stump upon the right side. At the sound of his strident, angry cries, there was a movement in the huddled bundle upon the deck. It straightened itself into a little black man, the smallest I have ever seen, with a great misshapen head and a shock of tangled, dishevelled hair. Holmes had already drawn his revolver, and I whipped out mine at the sight of this savage, distorted creature. He was wrapped in some sort of dark ulster or blanket, which left only his face exposed. 
but that face was enough to give a man a sleepless night. Never have I seen features so deeply marked with all bestiality and cruelty. His small eyes glowed and burned with a somber light, and his thick lips were writhed back from his teeth, which grinned and chattered at us with a half-animal fury. Fire if he raises his hand, said Holmes quietly. We were within a boat's length by this time, and almost within touch of our quarry. I can see the two of them now as they stood, the white man with his legs far apart shrieking out curses, and the unhallowed dwarf with his hideous face and his strong yellow teeth gnashing at us in the light of our lantern. It was well that we had so clear a view of him. Even as we looked, he plucked out from under his covering a short, round piece of wood, like a school ruler, and clapped it to his lips. Our pistols rang out together. He whirled round, threw up his arms, and with a kind of choking cough, fell sideways into the stream. I caught one glimpse of his venomous, menacing eyes amid the white swirl of the waters. At the same moment, the wooden-legged man threw himself upon the rudder and put it hard down, so that his boat made straight in for the southern bank, while we shot past her stern, only clearing her by a few feet. We were round after her in an instant, but she was already nearly at the bank. It was a wild and desolate place, where the moon glimmered upon a wide expanse of marshland, with pools of stagnant water and beds of decaying vegetation. The launch with a dull thud ran up upon the mud bank, with her bow in the air and her stern flush with the water. The fugitive sprang out, but his stump instantly sank its whole length into the sodden soil. In vain he struggled and writhed. Not one step could he possibly take either forwards or backwards. He yelled in impotent rage and kicked frantically into the mud with his other foot. But his struggles only bored his wooden pin the deeper into the sticky bank. When we brought our launch alongside, he was so firmly anchored that it was only by throwing the end of a rope over his shoulders that we were able to haul him out and to drag him like some evil fish over our side. The two smiths, father and son, sat sullenly in their launch but came aboard meekly enough when commanded. The Aurora herself we hauled off and made fast to our stern. A solid iron chest of Indian workmanship stood upon the deck. This, there could be no question, was the same that had contained the ill-omened treasure of the Sholtos. There was no key, but it was of considerable weight, so we transferred it carefully to our own little cabin. As we steamed slowly upstream again, we flashed our searchlight in every direction, but there was no sign of the islander. Somewhere in the dark ooze at the bottom of the Thames lie the bones of that strange visitor to our shores. See here, said Holmes, pointing to the wooden hatchway. We were hardly quick enough with our pistols. There, sure enough, just behind where we had been standing, stuck one of those murderous darts which we knew so well. It must have whizzed between us at the instant that we fired. Holmes smiled at it and shrugged his shoulders in his easy fashion. But I confess that it turned me sick to think of the horrible death which had passed so close to us that night. Chapter 11 The Great Agra Treasure our captive sat in the cabin opposite to the iron box which he had done so much and waited so long to gain. He was a sunburned, reckless-eyed fellow with a network of lines and wrinkles all over his mahogany features which told of a hard, open-air life. There was a singular prominence about his bearded chin which marked a man who was not to be easily turned from his purpose. His age may have been fifty or thereabouts, for his black, curly hair was thickly shot with grey. His face in repose was not an unpleasing one, though his heavy brows and aggressive chin gave him, as I had lately seen, a terrible expression when moved to anger. He sat now with his handcuffed hands upon his lap and his head sunk upon his breast, while he looked with his keen, twinkling eyes at the box which had been the cause of his ill-doings. It seemed to me 
that there was more sorrow than anger in his rigid and contained countenance. Once he looked up at me with a gleam of something like humour in his eyes. Well, Jonathan Small, said Holmes, lighting a cigar, I am sorry that it has come to this. And so am I, sir, he answered frankly. I don't believe that I can swing over the job. I give you my word on the book that I never raised hand against Mr. Sholto. It was that little hell-hound Tonga who shot one of his cursed darts into him. I had no part in it, sir. I was as grieved as if it had been my blood relation. I welted the little devil with the slack end of the rope for it, but it was done, and I could not undo it again. Have a cigar, said Holmes, and you had best take a pull out of my flask, for you are very wet. How could you expect so small and weak a man as this black fellow to overpower Mr. Sholto and hold him while you were climbing the rope? You seem to know as much about it as if you were there, sir. The truth is that I hope to find the room clear. I knew the habits of the house pretty well, and it was the time when Mr. Sholto usually went down to his supper. I shall make no secret of the business. The best defence that I can make is just the simple truth. Now, if it had been the old Major, I would have swung for him with a light heart. I would have thought no more of knifing him than of smoking this cigar. But it's cursed hard that I should be lagged over this young Sholto with whom I had no quarrel whatever. You are under the charge of Mr. Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard. He is going to bring you up to my rooms, and I shall ask you for a true account of the matter. You must make a clean breast of it, for if you do, I hope that I may be of use to you. I think I can prove that the poison acts so quickly that the man was dead before ever you reached the room. That he was, sir. I never got such a turn in my life as when I saw him grinning at me with his head on his shoulder as I climbed through the window. It fairly shook me, sir. I'd have half killed Tonga for it if he had not scrambled off. That was how he came to leave his club, and some of his darts too, as he tells me, which I dare say helped to put you on our track, though how you kept on it is more than I can tell. I don't feel no malice against you for it. But it does seem a queer thing, he added with a bitter smile, that I, who have a fair claim to nigh upon half a million of money, should spend the first half of my life building a breakwater in the Andamans, and am like to spend the other half digging drains at Dartmoor. It was an evil day for me when first I clapped eyes upon the merchant Achmet and had to do with the Agra treasure, which never brought anything but a curse yet upon the man who owned it. To him it brought murder, to Major Sholto it brought fear and guilt. To me it has meant slavery for life. At this moment Athony Jones thrust his broad face and heavy shoulders into the tiny cabin. Quite a family party, he remarked. I think I shall have a pull at that flask, Holmes. Well, I think we may all congratulate each other. Pity we didn't take the other alive, but there was no choice. I say, Holmes, you must confess that you cut it rather fine. It was all we could do to overhaul her. All is well that ends well, said Holmes, but I certainly did not know that the Aurora was such a clipper. Smith says she is one of the fastest launches on the river, and that if he had had another man to help him with the engines, we should never have caught her. He swears he knew nothing of this Norwood business. Neither he did, cried our prisoner, not a word. I chose his launch because I heard that she was a flyer. We told him nothing, but we paid him well, and he was to get something handsome if we reached our vessel— the Esmeralda at Gravesend outward bound for the Brazils. Well, if he has done no wrong, we shall see that no wrong comes to him. If we are pretty quick in catching our men, we are not so quick in condemning them. It was amusing to notice how the consequential Jones was already beginning to give himself airs on the strength of the capture. From the slight smile which played over Sherlock Holmes's face, I could see that the speech had not been lost upon him. 
"'We will be at Vauxhall Bridge presently,' said Jones, "'and shall land you, Dr. Watson, with the treasure box. "'I need hardly tell you that I am taking a very grave responsibility upon myself in doing this. "'It is most irregular. "'But, of course, an agreement is an agreement. "'I must, however, as a matter of duty, send an inspector with you, "'since you have so valuable a charge. "'You will drive, no doubt. "'Yes, I shall drive.' It is a pity there is no key that we may make an inventory first. You will have to break it open. Where is the key, my man? At the bottom of the river, said Small shortly. Hm. There was no use your giving this unnecessary trouble. We have had work enough already through you. However, Doctor, I need not warn you to be careful. Bring the box back with you to the Baker Street rooms. You will find us there, on our way to the station. They landed me at Vauxhall, with my heavy iron box, and with a bluff, genial inspector as my companion. A quarter of an hour's drive brought us to Mrs. Cecil Forrester's. The servant seemed surprised at so late a visitor. Mrs. Cecil Forrester was out for the evening, she explained, and likely to be very late. Miss Morstan, however, was in the drawing-room. So to the drawing-room I went, box in hand, leaving the obliging inspector in the cab. She was seated by the open window, dressed in some sort of white, diaphanous material, with a little touch of scarlet at the neck and waist. The soft light of a shaded lamp fell upon her as she leaned back in the basket chair, playing over her sweet, grave face, and tinting with a dull, metallic sparkle the rich coils of her luxuriant hair. One white arm and hand drooped over the side of the chair, and her whole pose and figure spoke of an absorbing melancholy. At the sound of my footfall she sprang to her feet, however, and a bright flush of surprise and of pleasure coloured her pale cheeks. I heard a cab drive up, she said. I thought that Mrs. Forrester had come back very early, but I never dreamed that it might be you. What news have you brought me? I have brought something better than news, said I putting down the box upon the table, and speaking jovially and boisterously, though my heart was heavy within me. I have brought you something which is worth all the news in the world. I have brought you a fortune. She glanced at the iron box. Is that the treasure, then? she asked, coolly enough. Yes, this is the great Agra treasure. Half of it is yours and half is Thaddeus Sholto's. You will have a couple of hundred thousand each, think of that, an annuity of ten thousand pounds. There will be few richer young ladies in England. Is it not glorious? I think that I must have been rather overacting my delight, and that she detected a hollow ring in my congratulations, for I saw her eyebrows rise a little, and she glanced at me curiously. If I have it, said she, I owe it to you. No, no, I answered, not to me, but to my friend Sherlock Holmes. With all the will in the world, I could never have followed up a clue which has taxed even his analytical genius. As it was, we very nearly lost it at the last moment. Braddock, pray sit down and tell me all about it, Dr. Watson, said she. I narrated briefly what had occurred since I had seen her last. Holmes's new method of search, the discovery of the Aurora, the appearance of Athelney Jones, our expedition in the evening, and the wild chase down the Thames. She listened with parted lips and shining eyes to my recital of our adventures. When I spoke of the dart which had so narrowly missed us, she turned so white that I feared that she was about to faint. It is nothing, she said, as I hastened to pour her out some water. I am all right again. It was a shock to me to hear that I had placed my friends in such horrible peril. That is all over, I answered. It was nothing. I will tell you no more gloomy details. Let us turn to something brighter. There is the treasure. What could be brighter than that? I got leave to bring it with me, thinking that it would interest you to be the first to see it. It would be of the greatest interest to me, she said. There was no eagerness in her voice, however. It had struck her, doubtless, that it might seem ungracious upon her part to be indifferent to a prize which had cost so much to win. 
What a pretty box, she said, stooping over it. This is Indian work, I suppose. Yes, it is Benara's metalwork. And so heavy, she exclaimed, trying to raise it. The box alone must be of some value. Where is the key? Small threw it into the Thames, I answered. I must borrow Mrs. Forrester's poker. There was in the front a thick and broad hasp wrought in the image of a sitting Buddha. Under this I thrust the end of the poker and twisted it outward as a lever. The hasp sprang open with a loud snap. With trembling fingers I flung back the lid. We both stood gazing in astonishment. The box was empty. No wonder that it was heavy. The ironwork was two-thirds of an inch thick all round. It was massive, well-made and solid, like a chest constructed to carry things of great price, but not one shred or crumb of metal or jewellery lay within it. It was absolutely and completely empty. The treasure is lost, said Miss Morstan calmly. And as I listened to the words and realised what they meant, a great shadow seemed to pass from my soul. I did not know how this Agra treasure had weighed me down until now that it was finally removed. It was selfish, no doubt, disloyal, wrong, but I could realise nothing, save that the golden barrier was gone from between us. Thank God! I ejaculated from my very heart. She looked at me with a quick, questioning smile. Why do you say that? she asked. Because you are within my reach again, I said, taking her hand. She did not withdraw it. Because I love you, Mary, as truly as ever a man loved a woman. Because this treasure, these riches, sealed my lips. Now that they are gone, I can tell you how I love you. That is why I said, thank God. Then I say, thank God, too, she whispered, as I drew her to my side. Whoever had lost a treasure, I knew that night that I had gained one. Chapter 12 The Strange Story of Jonathan Small A very patient man was that inspector in the cab, for it was a weary time before I rejoined him. His face clouded over when I showed him the empty box. There goes the reward, said he gloomily. Where there is no money, there is no pay. This night's work would have been worth a tenner, each to Sam Brown and me, if the treasure had been there. Mr. Thaddeus Sholto is a rich man, I said. He will see that you are rewarded, treasure, or no. The inspector shook his head despondently, however. It's a bad job, he repeated, and so Mr. Athelney Jones will think. His forecast proved to be correct, for the detective looked blank enough when I got to Baker Street and showed him the empty box. They had only just arrived, Holmes the prisoner, and he, for they had changed their plans so far as to report themselves at a station upon the way. My companion lounged in his armchair with his usual listless expression, while Small sat stolidly opposite to him with his wooden leg cocked over his sound one. As I exhibited the empty box, he leaned back in his chair and laughed aloud. This is your doing, Small, said Athony Jones angrily. Yes, I have put it away where you shall never lay hand upon it, he cried exultantly. It is my treasure, and if I can't have the loot, I'll take darned good care that no one else does. I tell you that no living man has any right to it, unless it is three men who are in the Andaman convict barracks, and myself. I know now that I cannot have the use of it, and I know that they cannot. I have acted all through for them as much as for myself. It's been the sign of four with us always. Well, I know that they would have had me do just what I have done, and throw the treasure into the Thames, rather than let it go to Kith, or Kin of Sholto, or of Morstan. It was not to make them rich that we did for Achmet. You'll find the treasure where the key is and where little Tonga is. When I saw that your launch must catch us, I put the loot away in a safe place. There are no rupees for you this journey. You are deceiving us, Small, said Athelney Jones sternly. If you had wished to throw the treasure into the Thames, it would have been easier for you to have thrown box and all. 
Easier for me to throw and easier for you to recover, he answered, with a shrewd, sidelong look. The man that was clever enough to hunt me down is clever enough to pick an iron box from the bottom of a river. Now that they are scattered over five miles or so, it may be a harder job. It went to my heart to do it, though. I was half mad when you came up with us. However, there's no good grieving over it. I've had ups in my life and I've had downs, but I've learned not to cry over spilled milk. This is a very serious matter, Small, said the detective. If you had helped justice, instead of thwarting it in this way, you would have had a better chance at your trial. Justice, snarled the ex-convict. A pretty justice. Whose loot is this if it is not ours? Where is the justice that I should give it up to those who have never earned it? Look how I have earned it. Twenty long years in that fever-ridden swamp, all day at work under the mangrove tree, all night chained up in the filthy convict huts, bitten by mosquitoes, racked with ague, bullied by every cursed, black-faced policeman who loved to take it out of a white man. That was how I earned the Agra treasure. And you talk to me of justice, because I cannot bear to feel that I have paid this price, only that another may enjoy it. I would rather swing a score of times or have one of Tonga's darts in my hide than live in a convict's cell and feel that another man is at his ease in a palace with the money that should be mine. Small had dropped his mask of stoicism, and all this came out in a wild whirl of words while his eyes blazed and the handcuffs clanked together with the impassioned movement of his hands. I could understand, as I saw the fury and the passion of the man, that it was no groundless or unnatural terror which had possessed Major Sholto when he first learned that the injured convict was upon his track. "'You forget that we know nothing of all this,' said Holmes quietly. "'We have not heard your story, and we cannot tell how far justice may originally have been on your side.' "'Well, sir, you have been very fair-spoken to me,' though I can see that I have you to thank that I have these bracelets upon my wrists. Still, I bear no grudge for that. It is all fair and above board. If you want to hear my story, I have no wish to hold it back. What I say to you is God's truth, every word of it. Thank you, you can put the glass beside me here, and I'll put my lips to it if I am dry. I am a Worcestershire man myself, born near Peshaw. I dare say you would find a heap of smalls living there now if you were to look. I have often thought of taking a look round there, but the truth is that I was never much of a credit to the family, and I doubt if they would be so very glad to see me. They were all steady, chapel-going folk, small farmers, well-known and respected over the countryside, while I was always a bit of a rover. At last, however, when I was about eighteen, I gave them no more trouble, for I got into a mess over a girl, and could only get out of it again by taking the Queen's shilling and joining the third buffs, which was just starting for India. I wasn't destined to do much soldiering, however. I had just got past the goose step and learned to handle my musket when I was fool enough to go swimming in the Ganges. Luckily for me, my company sergeant, John Holder, was in the water at the same time, and he was one of the finest swimmers in the service. A crocodile took me, just as I was halfway across, and nipped off my right leg as clean as a surgeon could have done it, just above the knee. What with the shock and the loss of blood, I fainted, and should have drowned if Holder had not caught hold of me and paddled for the bank. I was five months in hospital over it, and when at last I was able to limp out of it with this timber toe strapped to my stump, I found myself invalided out of the army and unfitted for any active occupation. I was, as you can imagine, pretty down on my luck at this time, for I was a useless cripple, though not yet in my twentieth year. However, my misfortune soon proved to be a blessing in disguise. A man named Abel White, who had come out there as an indigo planter, wanted an overseer to look after his coolies and keep them up to their work. He happened to be a friend of our colonel's, who had taken an interest in me since the accident. To make a long story short, the colonel recommended me strongly for the post, 
and as the work was mostly to be done on horseback, my leg was no great obstacle, for I had enough knee left to keep good grip on the saddle. What I had to do was to ride over the plantation to keep an eye on the men as they worked and to report the idlers. The pay was fair, I had comfortable quarters, and altogether I was content to spend the remainder of my life in indigo planting. Mr. Abel White was a kind man, and he would often drop into my little shanty and smoke a pipe with me, for white folk out there feel their hearts warm to each other as they never do here at home. Well, I was never in Luxway long. Suddenly, without a note of warning, the great mutiny broke upon us. One month India lay as still and peaceful, to all appearance, as Surrey or Kent. The next, there were two hundred thousand black devils let loose, and the country was a perfect hell. Of course you know all about it, gentlemen. A deal more than I do, very like, since reading is not in my line. I only know what I saw with my own eyes. Our plantation was at a place called Mutra, near the border of the northwest provinces. Night after night, the whole sky was alight with the burning bungalows, and day after day we had small companies of Europeans passing through our estate with their wives and children on their way to Agra, where were the nearest troops. Mr. Abel White was an obstinate man. He had it in his head that the affair had been exaggerated, and that it would blow over as suddenly as it had sprung up. There he sat on his veranda, drinking whiskey pegs and smoking cheroots, while the country was in a blaze about him. Of course we stuck by him, Iron Dawson, who, with his wife, used to do the bookwork and the managing. Well, one fine day the crash came. I had been away on a distant plantation and was riding slowly home in the evening when my eye fell upon something all huddled together at the bottom of a steep nuller. I rode down to see what it was, and the cold struck through my heart when I found it was Dawson's wife, all cut into ribbons and half-eaten by jackals and native dogs. A little further up the road, Dawson himself was lying on his face, quite dead, with an empty revolver in his hand and four sepoys lying across each other in front of him. I reined up my horse, wondering which way I should turn, but at that moment I saw thick smoke curling up from Abel White's bungalow and the flames beginning to burst through the roof. I knew then that I could do my employer no good, but would only throw my own life away if I meddled in the matter. From where I stood, I could see hundreds of the black fiends, with their red coats still on their backs, dancing and howling round the burning house. Some of them pointed at me, and a couple of bullets sang past my head. So I broke away across the paddy fields and found myself late at night safe within the walls at Agra. As it proved, however, there was no great safety there either. The whole country was up like a swarm of bees. Wherever the English could collect in little bands, they held just the ground that their guns commanded. Everywhere else they were helpless fugitives. It was a fight of the millions against the hundreds, and the cruelest part of it was that these men that we fought against, foot, horse, and gunners, were our own picked troops whom we had taught and trained, handling our own weapons and blowing our own bugle calls. At Agra there were the third Bengal Fusiliers, some Sikhs, two troops of horse, and a battery of artillery. A volunteer corps of clerks and merchants had been formed, and this I joined, wooden leg and all. We went out to meet the rebels at Shagunga early in July, and we beat them back for a time but our powder gave out, and we had to fall back upon the city. Nothing but the worst news came to us from every side, which is not to be wondered at, for if you look at the map, you will see that we were right in the heart of it. Lucknow is rather better than a hundred miles to the east, and Cornpore about as far to the south. From every point on the compass, there was nothing but torture and murder and outrage. The city of Agra is a great place, swarming with fanatics and fierce devil-worshippers 
of all sorts. Our handful of men were lost among the narrow, winding streets. Our leader moved across the river, therefore, and took up his position in the old fort at Agra. I don't know if any of you gentlemen have ever read or heard anything of that old fort. It is a very queer place, the queerest that ever I was in, and I have been in some rum corners too. First of all, it is enormous in size. I should think that the enclosure must be acres and acres. There is a modern part which took all our garrison, women, children, stores and everything else with plenty of room over, but the modern part is nothing like the size of the old quarter where nobody goes, and which is given over to the scorpions and the centipedes. It is all full of great deserted halls and winding passages and long corridors twisting in and out, so that it is easy enough for folk to get lost in it. For this reason it was seldom that anyone went into it, though now and again a party with torches might go exploring. The river washes along the front of the old fort and so protects it, but on the sides and behind there are many doors, and these had to be guarded, of course, in the old quarter as well as in that which was actually held by our troops. We were short-handed, with hardly men enough to man the angles of the building and to serve the guns. It was impossible for us, therefore, to station a strong guard at every one of the innumerable gates. What we did was to organize a central guardhouse in the middle of the fort, and to leave each gate under the charge of one white man and two or three natives. I was selected to take charge, during certain hours of the night, of a small isolated door upon the southwest side of the building. Two Sikh troopers were placed under my command, and I was instructed if anything went wrong to fire my musket, when I might rely upon help, coming at once from the central guard. As the guard was a good two hundred paces away, however, and as the space between was cut up into a labyrinth of passages and corridors, I had great doubts as to whether they could arrive in time to be of any use in case of an actual attack. Well, I was pretty proud at having this small command given me, since I was a raw recruit and a game-legged one at that. For two nights I kept the watch with my Punjabis. They were tall, fierce-looking chaps, Mohammed Singh and Abdullah Khan by name, both old fighting men who had borne arms against us at Chilianwala. They could talk English pretty well, but I could get little out of them. They preferred to stand together and jabber all night in their queer Sikh lingo. For myself, I used to stand outside the gateway, looking down on the broad, winding river and on the twinkling lights of the great city. The beating of drums, the rattle of tom-toms and the yells and howls of the rebels, drunk with opium and with bang, were enough to remind us all night of our dangerous neighbours across the stream. Every two hours the officer of the night used to come round to all the posts to make sure that all was well. The third night of my watch was dark and dirty with a small driving rain. It was dreary work standing in the gateway hour after hour in such weather. I tried again and again to make my Sikhs talk, but without much success. At two in the morning the rounds passed, and broke for a moment the weariness of the night. Finding that my companions would not be led into conversation, I took out my pipe and laid down my musket to strike the match. In an instant the two Sikhs were upon me. One of them snatched my firelock up and leveled it at my head, while the other held a great knife to my throat and swore between his teeth that he would plunge it into me if I moved a step. My first thought was that these fellows were in league with the rebels, and that this was the beginning of an assault. If our door were in the hands of the sepoys, the place must fall, and the women and children be treated as they were in Cornpore. Maybe you gentlemen think that I'm just making out a case for myself, but I give you my word that when I thought of that, though I felt the point of the knife at my throat, I opened my mouth with the intention of giving a scream, if it was my last one, which might alarm the main guard. The man who held me seemed to know my thoughts, for even as I braced myself to it, he whispered, Don't make a noise. The fort is safe enough. There are no rebel dogs on this side of the river. There was the ring of truth in what he said, 
and I knew that if I raised my voice, I was a dead man. I could read it in the fellow's brown eyes. I waited, therefore, in silence to see what it was that they wanted from me. Listen to me, Sahib, said the taller and fiercer of the pair, the one whom they called Abdullah Khan. You must either be with us now, or you must be silenced forever. The thing is too great a one for us to hesitate. Either you are heart and soul with us on your oath on the cross of the Christians, or your body this night shall be thrown into the ditch, and we shall pass over to our brothers in the rebel army. There is no middle way. Which is it to be, death or life? We can only give you three minutes to decide, for the time is passing, and all must be done before the rounds come again. How can I decide? said I. You have not told me what you want of me, but I tell you now that if it is anything against the safety of the fort, I will have no truck with it, so you can drive home your knife and welcome. It is nothing against the fort, said he. We only ask you to do that which your countrymen come to this land for. We ask you to be rich. If you will be one of us this night, we will swear to you upon the naked knife, and by the threefold oath which no Sikh was ever known to break, that you shall have your fair share of the loot. A quarter of the treasure shall be yours. We can say no fairer. But what is the treasure then? I asked. I am as ready to be rich as you can be, if you will, but show me how it can be done. You will swear then, said he, by the bones of your father, by the honour of your mother, by the cross of your faith, to raise no hand and speak no word against us, either now or afterwards. I will swear it, I answered, provided that the fort is not endangered. Then my comrade and I will swear that you shall have a quarter of the treasure which shall be equally divided among the four of us. There are but three, said I. No, Dost Akbar must have his share. We can tell the tale to you while we await them. Do you stand at the gate, Mahomet Singh, and give notice of their coming? The thing stands thus, Sahib, and I tell it to you because I know that an oath is binding upon a Feringhi, and that we may trust you. Had you been a lying Hindu, though you had sworn by all the gods in their false temples, your blood would have been upon the knife and your body in the water. But the Sikh knows the Englishman, and the Englishman knows the Sikh. Hearken, then, to what I have to say. There is a Raja in the northern provinces who has much wealth, though his lands are small. Much has come to him from his father, and more still he has set by himself, for he is of a low nature and hoards his gold rather than spend it. When the troubles broke out, he would be friends both with the lion and the tiger, with the sepoy and with the company's raj. Soon, however, it seemed to him that the white men's day was come, for through all the land he could hear of nothing but of their death and their overthrow. Yet, being a careful man, he made such plans that, come what might, half at least of his treasure should be left to him, that which was in gold and silver he kept by him in the vaults of his palace, but the most precious stones and the choicest pearls that he had he put in an iron box and sent it by a trusty servant, who, under the guise of a merchant, should take it to the fort at Agra, there to lie until the land is at peace. Thus, if the rebels won, he would have his money, but if the company conquered his jewels would be saved to him. Having thus divided his hoard, he threw himself into the cause of the sepoys, since they were strong upon his borders. By doing this, mark you, Sahib, his property becomes the due of those who have been true to their salt. This pretended merchant, who travels under the name of Ahmet, is now in the city of Agra and desires to gain his way into the fort. He has with him, as travelling companion, my foster brother, Dost Akbar, who knows his secret. Dost Akbar has promised this night to lead him to a side postern of the fort and has chosen this one for his purpose. Here he will come presently, and here he will find Mahomet Singh and myself awaiting him. The place is lonely, and none shall know of his coming. 
the world shall know of the merchant Achmet no more, but the great treasure of the Raja shall be divided among us. What say you to it, Sahib? In Worcestershire, the life of a man seems a great and a sacred thing, but it is very different when there is fire and blood all round you, and you have been used to meeting death at every turn. Whether Achmet the merchant lived or died was a thing as light as air to me, but at the talk about the treasure, my heart turned to it, and I thought of what I might do in the old country with it, and how my folk would stare when they saw their ne'er do well coming back with his pockets full of gold moidors. I had, therefore, already made up my mind. Abdullah Khan, however, thinking that I hesitated, pressed the matter more closely. Consider, Sahib, said he, that if this man is taken by the commandant, he will be hung or shot, and his jewels taken by the government, so that no man will be a rupee the better for them. Now, since we do the taking of him, why should we not do the rest as well? The jewels will be as well with us as in the company's coffers. There will be enough to make every one of us rich men and great chiefs. No one can know about the matter, for here we are cut off from all men. What could be better for the purpose? Say again then, Sahib, whether you are with us or if we must look upon you as an enemy. I am with you heart and soul, said I. It is well, he answered, handing me back my firelock. You see that we trust you, for your word like ours is not to be broken. We have now only to wait for my brother and the merchant. Does your brother know, then, of what you will do? I asked. The plan is his. He has devised it. We will go to the gate and share the watch with Mahomet Singh. The rain was still falling steadily, for it was just the beginning of the wet season. Brown, heavy clouds were drifting across the sky, and it was hard to see more than a stone cast. A deep moat lay in front of our door, but the water was in places nearly dried up, and it could easily be crossed. It was strange to me to be standing there with those two wild Punjabis waiting for the man who was coming to his death. Suddenly, my eye caught the glint of a shaded lantern at the other side of the moat. It vanished among the mound heaps, and then appeared again, coming slowly in our direction. Here they are, I exclaimed. You will challenge him, Sahib, as usual, whispered Abdullah. Give him no cause for fear. Send us in with him, and we shall do the rest, while you stay here on guard. Have the lantern ready to uncover, that we may be sure that it is indeed the man. The light had flickered onwards now stopping and now advancing, until I could see two dark figures upon the other side of the moat. I let them scramble down the sloping bank, splash through the mire, and climb halfway up to the gate before I challenged them. Who goes there? said I in a subdued voice. Friends, came the answer. I uncovered my lantern and threw a flood of light upon them. The first was an enormous Sikh, with a black beard which swept nearly down to his cummerbund. Outside of a show I have never seen so tall a man. The other was a little fat, round fellow, with a great yellow turban, and a bundle in his hand, done up in a shawl. He seemed to be all in a quiver with fear, for his hands twitched as if he had the ague, and his head kept turning to left and right with two bright little twinkling eyes like a mouse when he ventures out from his hole. It gave me the chills to think of killing him, but I thought of the treasure, and my heart set as hard as a flint within me. When he saw my white face, he gave a little chirrup of joy and came running up towards me. Your protection, Sahib, he panted, your protection for the unhappy merchant Agmet. I have travelled across Rajputana that I might seek the shelter of the fort at Agra. I have been robbed and beaten and abused because I have been the friend of the company. It is a blessed night this when I am once more in safety, I and my poor possessions. What have you in the bundle? I asked. An iron box, 
he answered, which contains one or two little family matters, which are of no value to others, but which I should be sorry to lose. Yet I am not a beggar, and I shall reward you, young Sahib, and your governor also, if he will give me the shelter I ask. I could not trust myself to speak longer with the man. The more I looked at his fat, frightened face, the harder did it seem that we should slay him in cold blood. It was best to get it over. Take him to the main guard, said I. The two Sikhs closed in upon him on each side, and the giant walked behind while they marched in through the dark gateway. Never was a man so compassed round with death. I remained at the gateway with the lantern. I could hear the measured tramp of their footsteps sounding through the lonely corridors. Suddenly it ceased, and I heard voices and a scuffle with the sound of blows. A moment later there came, to my horror, a rush of footsteps coming in my direction with the loud breathing of a running man. I turned my lantern down the long, straight passage, and there was the fat man, running like the wind, with a smear of blood across his face and close at his heels, bounding like a tiger, the great black-bearded Sikh with a knife flashing in his hand. I have never seen a man run so fast as that little merchant. He was gaining on the Sikh, and I could see that if he once passed me and got to the open air, he would save himself yet. My heart softened to him, but again the thought of his treasure turned me hard and bitter. I cast my firelock between his legs as he raced past, and he rolled twice over like a shot rabbit. Ere he could stagger to his feet, the Sikh was upon him and buried his knife twice in his side. The man never uttered moan nor moved muscle, but lay where he had fallen. I think myself that he may have broken his neck with the fall. You see, gentlemen, that I am keeping my promise. I am telling you every work of the business just exactly as it happened, whether it is in my favour or not. He stopped and held out his manacled hands for the whiskey and water which Holmes had brewed for him. For myself I confess that I had now conceived the utmost horror of the man, not only for this cold-blooded business in which he had been concerned, but even more for the somewhat flippant and careless way in which he narrated it. Whatever punishment was in store for him, I felt that he might expect no sympathy from me. Sherlock Holmes and Jones sat with their hands upon their knees, deeply interested in the story, but with the same disgust written upon their faces. He may have observed it, for there was a touch of defiance in his voice and manner as he proceeded. It was all very bad, no doubt, said he. I should like to know how many fellows in my shoes would have refused a share of this loot when they knew that they would have their throats cut for their pains. Besides, it was my life or his when once he was in the fort. If he had got out, the whole business would come to light, and I should have been court-martialed and shot as likely as not, for people were not very lenient at a time like that. Go on with your story, said Holmes shortly. Well, we carried him in, Abdullah, Akbar, and I. A fine weight he was, too, for all that he was so short. Mohammed Singh was left to guard the door. We took him to a place which the Sikhs had already prepared. It was some distance off, where a winding passage leads to a great empty hall, the brick walls of which were all crumbling to pieces. The earth floor had sunk in at one place, making a natural grave, so we left Achmet the merchant there, having first covered him over with loose bricks. This done, we all went back to the treasure. It lay where he had dropped it when he was first attacked. The box was the same which now lies open upon your table. A key was hung by a silken cord to that carved handle upon the top. We opened it, and the light of the lantern gleamed upon a collection of gems, such as I have read of and thought about when I was a little lad at Pershaw. It was blinding to look upon them. When we had feasted our eyes, we took them all out and made a list of them. There were 143 diamonds of the first water, including one which has been called, I believe, the Great Mogul, and is said to be the second largest stone in existence. 
Then there were ninety-seven very fine emeralds and one hundred and seventy rubies, some of which, however, were small. There were forty carbuncles, two hundred and ten sapphires, sixty-one agates, and a great quantity of beryls, onyxes, cat's eyes, turquoises, and other stones, the very names of which I did not know at the time, though I have become more familiar with them since. Besides this, there were nearly three hundred very fine pearls, twelve of which were set in a gold coronet. By the way, these last had been taken out of the chest and were not there when I recovered it. After we had counted our treasures, we put them back into the chest and carried them to the gateway to show them to Mahomet Singh. Then we solemnly renewed our oath to stand by each other and be true to our secret. We agreed to conceal our loot in a safe place until the country should be at peace again and then to divide it equally among ourselves. There was no use dividing it at present, for if gems of such value were found upon us it would cause suspicion, and there was no privacy in the fort nor any place where we could keep them. We carried the box, therefore, into the same hall where we had buried the body, and there, under certain bricks in the best preserved wall, we made a hollow and put our treasure. We made careful note of the place, and next day I drew four plans, one for each of us, and put the sign of the four of us at the bottom, for we had sworn that we should each always act for all, so that none might take advantage. That is an oath that I can put my hand to my heart and swear that I have never broken. Well, there's no use my telling you gentlemen what came of the Indian mutiny. After Wilson took Delhi and Sir Colin relieved Lucknow, the back of the business was broken. Fresh troops came pouring in, and Nana Sahib made himself scarce over the frontier. A flying column under Colonel Grathard came round to Agra and cleared the Pandies away from it. Peace seemed to be settling upon the country, and we four were beginning to hope that the time was at hand when we might safely go off with our shares of the plunder. In a moment, however, our hopes were shattered by our being arrested as the murderers of Akhmet. It came about in this way. When the Raja put his jewels into the hands of Akhmet, he did it because he knew that he was a trusty man. They are suspicious folk in the East, however. So what does this Raja do but take a second even more trusty servant and set him to play the spy upon the first? This second man was ordered never to let Ahmed out of his sight, and he followed him like his shadow. He went after him that night and saw him pass through the doorway. Of course he thought he had taken refuge in the fort and applied for admission there himself next day, but could find no trace of Ahmed. This seemed to him so strange that he spoke about it to a sergeant of guides who brought it to the ears of the commandant. A thorough search was quickly made and the body was discovered. Thus, at the very moment that we thought that all was safe, we were all four seized and brought to trial on a charge of murder, three of us because we had held the gate that night, and the fourth because he was known to have been in the company of the murdered man. Not a word about the jewels came out at the trial, for the Raja had been deposed and driven out of India, so no one had any particular interest in them. The murder, however, was clearly made out, and it was certain that we must all have been concerned in it. The three Sikhs got penal servitude for life, and I was condemned to death, though my sentence was afterwards commuted into the same as the others. It was rather a queer position that we found ourselves in then. There we were all four tied by the leg, and with precious little chance of ever getting out again, while we each held a secret which might have put each of us in a palace if we could only have made use of it. It was enough to make a man eat his heart out to have to stand the kick and the cuff of every petty jack in office, to have rice to eat and water to drink when that gorgeous fortune was ready for him outside, just waiting to be picked up. It might have driven me mad, but I was always a pretty stubborn one, so I just held on and bided my time. At last it seemed to me to have come. I was changed from Agra to Madras, and from there to Blair Island in the Andamans. There are very few white convicts at this settlement, and as I had behaved well from the first, 
I soon found myself a sort of privileged person. I was given a hut in Hope Town, which is a small place on the slopes of Mount Harriet, and I was left pretty much to myself. It is a dreary, fever-stricken place, and all beyond our little clearings was infested with wild cannibal natives who were ready enough to blow a poisoned dart at us if they saw a chance. There was digging and ditching and yam planting and a dozen other things to be done, so we were busy enough all day, though in the evening we had a little time to ourselves. Among other things, I learned to dispense drugs for the surgeon and picked up a smattering of his knowledge. All the time I was on the lookout for a chance of escape but it is hundreds of miles from any other land, and there is little or no wind in those seas, so it was a terribly difficult job to get away. The surgeon, Dr. Summerton, was a fast, sporting young chap, and the other young officers would meet in his rooms of an evening and play cards. The surgery, where I used to make up my drugs, was next to his sitting room, with a small window between us. Often, if I felt lonesome, I used to turn out the lamp in the surgery, and then, standing there, I could hear their talk and watch their play. I am fond of a hand at cards myself, and it was almost as good as having one to watch the others. There was Major Sholto, Captain Morstan, and Lieutenant Bromley Brown, who were in command of the native troops, and there was the surgeon himself, and two or three prison officials, crafty old hands who played a nice, sly, safe game a very snug little party they used to make. Well, there was one thing which very soon struck me, and that was that the soldiers used always to lose and the civilians to win. Mind, I don't say that there was anything unfair, but so it was. These prison chaps had done little else than play cards ever since they had been at the Andamans, and they knew each other's game to a point, while the others just played to pass the time and threw their cards down anyhow. Night after night the soldiers got up poorer men, and the poorer they got the more keen they were to play. Major Sholto was the hardest hit. He used to pay in notes and gold at first, but soon it came to notes of hand and for big sums. He sometimes would win for a few deals just to give him heart, and then the luck would set in against him worse than ever. All day he would wander about as black as thunder, and he took to drinking a deal more than was good for him. One night he lost even more heavily than usual. I was sitting in my hut when he and Captain Morstan came stumbling along on the way to their quarters. They were bosom friends, those two, and never far apart. The Major was raving about his losses. "'It's all up, Morstan,' he was saying, as they passed my hut. "'I shall have to send in my papers. I am a ruined man.' "'Nonsense, old chap,' said the other, slapping him upon the shoulder. I've had a nasty face of myself, but that was all I could hear, but it was enough to set me thinking. A couple of days later, Major Sholto was strolling on the beach, so I took the chance of speaking to him. I wish to have your advice, Major, said I. Well, Small, what is it? he asked, taking his cheroot from his lips. I wanted to ask you, sir, said I, who is the proper person to whom hidden treasure should be handed over? I know where half a million worth lies, and, as I cannot use it myself, I thought perhaps the best thing that I could do would be to hand it over to the proper authorities, and then perhaps they would get my sentence shortened for me. Half a million small, he gasped, looking hard at me, to see if I was in earnest. Quite that, sir, in jewels and pearls. It lies there ready for anyone, and the queer thing about it is that the real owner is outlawed and cannot hold property so that it belongs to the first comer. To government, Small, he stammered, to government. But he said it in a halting fashion, and I knew in my heart that I had got him. You think then, sir, that I should give the information to the Governor-General? said I quietly. Well, well, you must not do anything rash, or that you might repent. Let me hear all about it, Small. Give me the facts. I told him the whole story with small changes so that he could not identify the places. When I had finished, he stood stock still and full of thought. I could see by the twitch of his lip 
that there was a struggle going on within him. This is a very important matter, Small, he said at last. You must not say a word to anyone about it, and I shall see you again soon. Two nights later, he and his friend Captain Morstan came to my hut in the dead of the night with a lantern. I want you just to let Captain Morstan hear that story from your own lips, Small, said he. I repeated it as I had told it before. It rings true, eh? said he. It's good enough to act upon. Captain Morstan nodded. Look here, Small, said the Major. We have been talking it over, my friend, here and I, and we have come to the conclusion that this secret of yours is hardly a government matter after all, but is a private concern of your own, which, of course, you have the power of disposing of as you think best. Now the question is, what price would you ask for it? We might be inclined to take it up and at least look into it, if we could agree as to terms. He tried to speak in a cool, careless way, but his eyes were shining with excitement and greed. Why, as to that, gentlemen, I answered, trying also to be cool, but feeling as excited as he did. There is only one bargain which a man in my position can make. I shall want you to help me to my freedom and to help my three companions to theirs. We shall then take you into partnership and give you a fifth share to divide between you. Hmm, said he, a fifth share. That is not very tempting. It would come to fifty thousand apiece, said I. But how can we gain your freedom? You know very well that you ask an impossibility. Nothing of the sort, I answered. I have thought it all out to the last detail. The only bar to our escape is that we can get no boat fit for the voyage, and no provisions to last us for so long a time. There are plenty of little yachts and yawls at Calcutta or Madras which would serve our turn well. Do you bring one over? We shall engage to get aboard her by night, and if you will drop us on any part of the Indian coast, you will have done your part of the bargain. If there were only one, he said, None or all, I answered. We have sworn it. The four of us must always act together. You see, Morstan, said he, Small is a man of his word. He does not flinch from his friend. I think we may very well trust him. It's a dirty business, the other answered. Yet, as you say, the money would save our commissions handsomely. Well, Small, said the Major, we must, I suppose, try and meet you. We must first, of course, test the truth of your story. Tell me where the box is hid, and I shall get leave of absence and go back to India in the monthly relief boat to inquire into the affair. Not so fast, said I, growing colder as he got hot. I must have the consent of my three comrades. I tell you that it is four or none with us. Nonsense, he broke in. What have three black fellows to do with our agreement? Black or blue, said I, they are in with me, and we all go together. Well, the matter ended by a second meeting at which Mohammed Singh, Abdullah Khan, and Dost Akbar were all present. We talked the matter over again, and at last we came to an arrangement. We were to provide both the officers with charts of the part of the Agra fort and mark the place in the wall where the treasure was hid. Major Sholto was to go to India to test our story. If he found the box, he was to leave it there, to send out a small yacht provisioned for a voyage, which was to lie off Rutland Island and to which we were to make our way, and finally to return to his duties. Captain Morstan was then to apply for leave of absence, to meet us at Agra, and there we were to have a final division of the treasure, he taking the Major's share as well as his own. All this we sealed by the most solemn oaths that the mind could think or the lips utter. I sat up all night with paper and ink, and by the morning I had the two charts all ready, signed with the sign of four, that is, of Abdullah, Akbar, Mahomet, and myself. Well, gentlemen, I weary you with my long story and I know that my friend Mr. Jones is impatient to get me safely stowed in Chokey. I'll make it as short as I can. The villain Sholto went off to India, 
but he never came back again. Captain Morstan showed me his name among a list of passengers in one of the mail boats very shortly afterwards. His uncle had died, leaving him a fortune, and he had left the army, yet he could stoop to treat five men as he had treated us. Morstan went over to Agra shortly afterwards and found, as we expected, that the treasure was indeed gone. The scoundrel had stolen it all, without carrying out one of the conditions on which we had sold him the secret. From that day I lived only for vengeance. I thought of it by day, and I nursed it by night. It became an overpowering, absorbing passion with me. I cared nothing for the law, nothing for the gallows. To escape, to track down Sholto, to have my hand upon his throat, that was my one thought. Even the Agra treasure had come to be a smaller thing in my mind than the slaying of Sholto. Well, I have set my mind on many things in this life, and never one which I did not carry out. But it was weary years before my time came. I have told you that I had picked up something of medicine. One day, when Dr. Summerton was down with a fever, a little Andaman Islander was picked up by a convict gang in the woods. He was sick to death and had gone to a lonely place to die. I took him in hand, though he was as venomous as a young snake, and after a couple of months I got him all right and able to walk. He took a kind of fancy to me then, and would hardly go back to his woods, but was always hanging about my hut. I learned a little of his lingo from him, and this made him all the fonder of me. Tonga, for that was his name, was a fine boatman and owned a big, roomy canoe of his own. When I found that he was devoted to me and would do anything to serve me, I saw my chance of escape. I talked it over with him. He was to bring his boat round on a certain night to an old wharf, which was never guarded, and there he was to pick me up. I gave him directions to have several gourds of water and a lot of yams, cocoa nuts, and sweet potatoes. He was stanch and true, was little Tonga. No man ever had a more faithful mate. At the night named, he had his boat at the wharf. As it chanced, however, there was one of the convict guard down there, a vile Pathan, who had never missed a chance of insulting and injuring me. I had always vowed vengeance, and now I had my chance. It was as if fate had placed him in my way that I might pay my debt before I left the island. He stood on the bank, with his back to me, and his carbine on his shoulder. I looked about for a stone to beat out his brains with, but none could I see. Then a queer thought came into my head and showed me where I could lay my hand on a weapon. I sat down in the darkness and unstrapped my wooden leg. With three long hops I was on him. He put his carbine to his shoulder, but I struck him full and knocked the whole front of his skull in. You can see the split in the wood now where I hit him. We both went down together, for I could not keep my balance, but when I got up I found him still lying quiet enough. I made for the boat, and in an hour we were well out at sea. Tonga had brought all his earthly possessions with him, his arms and his gods. Among other things, he had a long bamboo spear and some Andaman coconut matting, with which I made a sort of sail. For ten days we were beating about, trusting to luck, and on the eleventh we were picked up by a trader which was going from Singapore to Jidda with a cargo of Malay pilgrims. They were a rum crowd, and Tonga and I soon managed to settle down among them. They had one very good quality. They let you alone and asked no questions. Well, if I were to tell you all the adventures that my little chum and I went through, you would not thank me, for I would have you here until the sun was shining. Here and there we drifted about the world, something always turning up to keep us from London. All the time, however, I never lost sight of my purpose. I would dream of Sholto at night. A hundred times I have killed him in my sleep. At last, however, some three or four years ago, we found ourselves in England. I had no great difficulty in finding where Sholto lived, and I set to work to discover whether he had realized the treasure or if he still had it. I made friends with someone who could help me. I name no names, for I don't want to get anyone else in a hole. 
and I soon found that he still had the jewels. Then I tried to get at him in many ways, but he was pretty sly, and had always two prize fighters, besides his sons and his Kitmutka, on guard over him. One day, however, I got word that he was dying. I hurried at once to the garden, mad that he should slip out of my clutches like that, and looking through the window I saw him lying in his bed, with his sons on each side of him. I'd have come through and taken my chance with the three of them, only even as I looked at him his jaw dropped, and I knew that he was gone. I got into his room that same night, though, and I searched his papers to see if there was any record of where he had hidden our jewels. There was not a line, however, so I came away, bitter and savage as a man could be. Before I left, I bethought me that if I ever met my Sikh friends again, it would be a satisfaction to know that I had left some mark of our hatred. So I scrawled down the sign of the four of us, as it had been on the chart, and I pinned it on his bosom. It was too much that he should be taken to the grave without some token from the men whom he had robbed and befooled. We earned a living at this time by my exhibiting poor Tonga at fairs and other such places as the Black Cannibal. He would eat raw meat and dance his war dance, so we always had a hatful of pennies after a day's work. I still heard all the news from Pondicherry Lodge, and for some years there was no news to hear, except that they were hunting for the treasure. At last, however, came what we had waited for so long. The treasure had been found. It was up at the top of the house, in Mr. Bartholomew Sholto's chemical laboratory. I came at once and had a look at the place, but I could not see how with my wooden leg I was to make my way up to it. I learned, however, about a trapdoor in the roof and also about Mr. Sholto's supper hour. It seemed to me that I could manage the thing easily through Tonga. I brought him out with me with a long rope wound round his waist. He could climb like a cat, and he soon made his way through the roof. But, as ill luck would have it, Bartholomew Sholto was still in the room, to his cost. Tonga thought he had done something very clever in killing him, for when I came up by the rope I found him strutting about as proud as a peacock. Very much surprised was he when I made at him with the rope's end and cursed him for a little bloodthirsty imp. I took the treasure box and let it down, and then slid down myself, having first left the sign of the four upon the table, to show that the jewels had come back at last to those who had most right to them. Tonga then pulled up the rope, closed the window, and made off the way that he had come. I don't know that I have anything else to tell you. I had heard a waterman speak of the speed of Smith's launch, the Aurora, so I thought she would be a handy craft for our escape. I engaged with old Smith and was to give him a big sum if he got us safe to our ship. He knew, no doubt, that there was some screw loose, but he was not in our secrets. All this is the truth, and if I tell it to you, gentlemen, it is not to amuse you, for you have not done me a very good turn but it is because I believe the best defence I can make is just to hold back nothing, but let all the world know how badly I have myself been served by Major Sholto, and how innocent I am of the death of his son. A very remarkable account, said Sherlock Holmes, a fitting wind-up to an extremely interesting case. There is nothing at all new to me in the latter part of your narrative, except that you brought your own rope that I did not know. By the way, I had hoped that Tonga had lost all his darts, yet he managed to shoot one at us in the boat. He had lost them all, sir, except the one which was in his blowpipe at the time. Ah, of course, said Holmes. I had not thought of that. Is there any other point which you would like to ask about? asked the convict affably. I think not, thank you, my companion answered. Well, Holmes, said Athelney Jones, you are a man to be humoured, and we all know that you are a connoisseur of crime. But duty is duty, and I have gone rather far in doing what you and your friend asked me. I shall feel more at ease when we have our storyteller here safe under lock and key. The cab still waits, and there are two inspectors downstairs. I am much obliged to you both for your assistance. 
Of course, you will be wanted at the trial. Good night to you. Good night, gentlemen both, said Jonathan Small. You first, Small, remarked the wary Jones, as they left the room. I'll take particular care that you don't club me with your wooden leg, whatever you may have done to the gentleman at the Andaman Isles. Well, and there is the end of our little drama, I remarked, after we had set some time smoking in silence. I fear that it may be the last investigation in which I shall have the chance of studying your methods. Miss Morstan has done me the honour to accept me as a husband in perspective. He gave a most dismal groan. I feared as much, said he. I really cannot congratulate you. I was a little hurt. Have you any reason to be dissatisfied with my choice? I asked. Not at all. I think she is one of the most charming young ladies I ever met, and might have been most useful in such work as we have been doing. She had a decided genius that way, witness the way in which she preserved that agri-plan from all the other papers of her father. But love is an emotional thing, and whatever is emotional is opposed to that true cold reason which I place above all things. I should never marry myself, lest I bias my judgment. I trust, said I, laughing, that my judgment may survive the ordeal, but you look weary. Yes, the reaction is already upon me. I shall be as limp as a rag for a week. Strange, said I, how terms of what in another man I should call laziness alternate with your fits of splendid energy and vigour. Yes, he answered, there are in me the makings of a very fine loafer and also of a pretty spry sort of fellow. I often think of those lines of old Goethe, Schade, dass die Natur nur einen Mensch aus dir schuf, denn zum würdigen Mann war und zum Schelmen der Stoff. By the way, apropos of this Norwood business, you see that they had, as I surmised, a confederate in the house, who could be none other than Lal Rao, the butler. So Jones actually has the undivided honour of having caught one fish in his great hall. The division seems rather unfair, I remarked. You have done all the work in this business. I get a wife out of it. Jones gets the credit. Pray, what remains for you? For me, said Sherlock Holmes, there still remains the cocaine bottle. And he stretched his long white hand up for it.